Okay, I've just about had it up to here with these stupid fake news stories about finding aliens. Remember when the US Navy released actual footage of UFOs that were almost instantly, I mean literally within minutes, proven to be birds? Or that dimming on Tabby's star that was supposed to be an alien megastructure, but turned out to be interplanetary dust? Tiny particles of sand. And who can forget Omwamwa? What seemed to be an alien derelict that would awaken once it encountered life, like the ship from Rendezvous with Rama, was instead a long asteroid. But we're here and the camera's rolling. So let's go through their live stream press conference to see how they're going to pull us in and get us invested this time. Royal Astronomical Society. Sounds legit. And comments are off. At least proves they're smart. Professor Jane, let's see what she has to say. Thank you all for joining us for this special webcast. Oh, it's a guy. That's okay. We've all watched The Mentalist. Names are quite fluid these days, and rightly so. I'm Philip Diamond. It gives me great pleasure as director of the Royal Astronomical Society to welcome you. We are honored to host this press conference in our bicentenary year. You know what makes me think it's not aliens? The fact that he's not leading with aliens and talking about Royal Astronomical Centennial whatever instead. We have detected some kind of living organisms in the clouds of Venus. She did lead with aliens. Okay, I finished watching. And here's the deal. Venus reflects radio waves from the sun and we can detect those radio waves with radio telescopes. Some gases absorb radio waves of specific wavelengths. And we can detect the presence of these gases in a planet's atmosphere by finding dips in the spectrum of radio waves. Using these magnificent pieces of modern engineering, our friends here were able to probe the atmosphere of Venus. And what did they find? Phosphine, which we're all familiar with. You know, your typical nick, nick, nictogen hydride. A colorless, odorless gas that smells like rotten fish and garlic? You might be asking why phosphine means life. Well, according to the press conference, this is because on Earth, microbes produce phosphine in oxygen-free environments. They're not sure which microbes or what the process is, but it's known. Okay, that's a good starting point, but it's still far from convincing. Because if you look up the relative abundance of phosphine in the planets of the solar system, then the gas giants Saturn and Jupiter have plenty of it. So why would it surprise us to find it on Venus? Phosphine contains one atom of phosphorus and three atoms of hydrogen. The gas giants have a lot of hydrogen because of their immense gravitational force. But the smaller rocky planets like our Earth, for example, doesn't have much. Hydrogen, being very light, just sort of drifts apart from rocky planets over time. And this is even more true for Venus. An abundance of hydrogen is a prerequisite for forming phosphine, naturally on a planetary scale. So that's one strike against Venus already. The gas giants also leverage huge pressures and temperatures to drive the formation of phosphine. You might have heard that Venus is really hot and dense. And while relatively that might be true, it's nowhere close to what these absolute units can generate. So that strikes two and three. The scientists tried to figure out different chemical pathways through which phosphine can be created in an environment like Venus. He tried to look for sources of energy that could possibly do this. Solar energy could be driving it, or thermodynamics, or volcanic activity, or lightning. But his results showed that these sources were a million times too weak to account for the amount of phosphine that was observed. The results of all those calculations were that those sources would fall short by factors of millions or more of the rate needed to explain the observation we've got. At this point, having eliminated known chemical processes, the assumption is that microbes must have made these phosphine. But could this be a remnant from an earlier epoch and whatever life created it may no longer exist? Well, scientists believe that Venus was cool and wet at some point in the distant past until a runaway greenhouse effect raised the temperature to the current extremes. So life could have evolved on the surface, released phosphine and died out. And all we're seeing are the echoes of that attempt to rise out of inanimate matter. It appears this is not possible, because phosphine gets broken down within 20 minutes in Venus's sulfuric acid atmosphere. 
So that means, to account for the concentrations of phosphine observed, there is something constantly regenerating it. And if that something is life, then it may occupy 10% by volume of the clouds that occupy Venus, 60 km above the surface, where the temperature is 30 degrees Celsius. At this point, you probably have a lot of questions. Are Venusians carbon-based? Do they have DNA or an equivalent? Do they float around on tiny parachutes? And might they make good pets? I'm sure the scientific community is rushing to figure all of that out. There are already missions to Venus scheduled, including an orbiter mission from India that will no doubt turn its focus to this discovery. But assuming that the discovery does hold up, this opens up a few different lines of thinking. One swallow does not a summer make. Till now, as far as we knew, we were the only form of life in the universe. If two independent forms of life exist on two planets of the same solar system, an independent is important here. It's entirely plausible that both planets could have either cross-pollinated or been seeded by the same source. But if life evolved independently on two planets of the same solar system, life must be really, really common in the universe. Another thing that comes to mind is the Fermi paradox. If you're unfamiliar with the concept, then it means that given how long the universe has been around, early civilizations should have spread throughout the galaxy and we should be seeing their technological signatures. The paradox is that no such signatures have ever been found. One explanation for this paradox was that life is just really, really rare. But if life is common, then that means that there must be a different solution. It may be that a great filter lies ahead of us. One that unfailingly and imminently wipes out life after a certain stage in development. Maybe some process that transforms the environment, heating up the atmosphere beyond repair, at a phase when the civilization is technologically advanced enough to require large amounts of energy, but not advanced enough to either escape the planet or terraform it to undo the effects of warming. But let's not think grim thoughts right now. Congratulations, everyone. It's September 2020, and we're five months behind schedule, but we finally have aliens. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Like, share, subscribe, and start a conversation below to get more videos like this in your recommendations. I'll see you really soon. Bye.